Good afternoon. Um, one of our earlier speakers made reference to this thing that's slightly like graveyard shift. I think this is this is quite what it actually is. Um, what I want to talk about today, anyhow, is right the history of Irish food, uh, and you know, it's it's a subject which has its own fascination. I theoretically ought to attract more people here this evening, I would imagine. But um, the basic point about it is by comparison with the main themes in Irish history, it really isn't something. That has attracted much attention, but it's currently going through something of a, bit of a vigorous period. And the publication recently of a volume called Food and Drink in Ireland, by the Royal Irish Academy, as part of this proceedings of the Royal Irish Academy series, is an illustration of this fact. It really is quite an ambitious work in, on, on several levels. First of all, it's, it, in, in its scale and range, it's, uh, the volume which is here is huge by, by normal standards. It's over 400 pages. It contains 14 or 15 really major essays, but most importantly of all, it spans the range of Irish uh, food history, literally from the Mesolithic, which is began 8, 8 to 10,000 years ago, up to, up to the present. So it's, what it's trying to do is to create a pattern, to establish uh, an outline chronology that can, that can be built upon. Now it's not as if people haven't engaged this to some degree you know, previously. But what uh, food and drink in Ireland has, has done is uh, offer a whole host of new uh, of new vistas. In terms of the, those who write in it, I think it's fair to say that most of us aren't exactly household names. I would make one exception. Uh, Dimmer Furter is, is has made a written essay in it, and Dimmer is uh, really some in, in the historical academic community. Some people observe that we see more on the television than we see in the office. Which is at the front of Jim Woods right here at the moment. I apologise in, in, in advance for that unwarranted commentary on your, on your professionalism. But he, anyway, he's done an essay on food and drink of the, in the 20th century. Others include Regina Sexton, who's a noted food historian, Verona Kennelly, who's written a really good, quite fascinating piece on the impact, of, believe it or not, of the model kitchens developed by the ESB and on how they transformed uh, our lifestyle, all our lifestyles. Um, um, as a collection, um, the Irish independent uh, food and, and, and drink correspondent was very complimentary in describing it. It was usually presented as fascinating. But anyhow, enough of the puff. Let's talk about some aspects of what's, what's in it. And in that context, uh, I would be... It's really one of the... I want to focus on three things. One is the early modern period and um, how we actually go about reconstructing the history of foodstuffs in that period. Secondly, I want to talk about the history of alcohol. Uh, because it's about food and drink. And uh, to argue that to some degree, I think we've given it a bad press. Uh, and thirdly, then, I want to talk about uh, fine dining in the 21st and, and 20th centuries, uh, because this is an area which, unexpectedly, Ireland has actually got something of a reputation, which isn't necessarily how everybody perceives it. But uh, to talk about uh, the uh, writing of food, of, of food history in, in, in Ireland, uh, one of the problems you have is that whereas the politics and some degree economic history, there are statistical bases and there are, there are evidential bases on which we can draw on, in terms of food and the food culture, it's much more complicated in doing so. But there's been a source which we haven't been able to make sense of for some time. And this is the manuscript recipe books that were prepared by people in the 17th, 18th and early 19th centuries. In other words, long before they, they went into your local uh, news agent or your local bookstore and bought uh, <coughs> uh, Jimmy Oliver's guide to how you should cook for the modern person, uh, people were preparing their own books. Now, I'm, I'm not going to expect you to read this because it's quite obviously, it's, it's quite an 18th century. It's a recipe for rashad pops and it's in the in, it's an early 18th century uh, document. The truth of the matter is that what was happening in this period is that as big houses took shape, as the women of the household was assuming the responsibility of basically assembling her own recipe book. And some of you may recall the parents, even of her mothers usually, I fear, it was a female role, uh, doing so. Um, so what they were doing was they were assembling household uh, volumes in which they were putting particularly valuable pieces of information. And what was to be location of these uh, volumes was really two to three pieces of key information. The first of these was medical information, because basically med medicine, medication was assigned and administered in the home. Secondly, people were collecting uh, recipes. And thirdly, there was also some miscellaneous pieces of information 
about household, household matters. What this means is not so easy to identify, but basically what we assume it means is that uh, the, as the management of the household evolved, the women of the house were assuming a more managerial role and they were leaving the day-to-day -day duties to the cooks, to the servants and others. And, as you, and if you know a big house, how it operates, the, the kitchen was in the basement. It was being a trend which was continued for many centuries, only reversed in our own, in our own, in our own generation. So, we have these recipes, basically for generations, we don't know what to do with them. Uh, but a couple of things have emerged from the analysis that has been done of, of these. One is the emphasis that there was on sweets, on sweet things. Uh, partly the biggest coincidence was the availability of sugar, which is a relatively recent phenomenon. Uh, but you find recipes for cakes, blanches, uh, syllabubs, creams, uh, all figuring very, 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 very uh, prominent. Interestingly also, what also features very prominently are drinks of flavoured wines, liqueurs, cordials, uh, which are quite uh, popular at, at the time, which was a means basically of drinking alcohol medicinally, or at least so I wish to argue. Just another one. Uh, there also is the unusual, and one that struck me very interestingly was obviously as the enthusiasm for, for food and and drink appreciated, in particular, became very popular during this period to drink tea and coffee. The problem is tea and coffee were very, very expensive. But also, the rituals associated with their uh, preparation was really quite expensive as, as, as well. So, in one of the books, they've got a recipe for artificial coffee. Now, uh, this isn't you know, uh, instant coffee as we, which is uh, in, my, in the place I work in. People are constantly complaining about the poor quality of the coffee and why they basically, you know, get this coffee, get an Americano or an espresso or whatever it is, get decent coffee, get Italian coffee in other words. You know, the Italians have been so famous at getting decent, getting decent coffee. So one of the mechanisms that was employed, and Candice is telling you this, uh, to create artificial coffee was to get effectively to burn bread. In other words, to effectively burn your toast, scrape off the bag, put it in water and drink it. I mean, you can't think of anything less advertising, but I dare say, if I hear, if what I hear people complaining about how poor some of the coffee is at times, maybe the, the, the analogy isn't as, as inappropriate as it, as it seems. A further advantage of utilising these, these books, these recipe books, um, is not that it shows you the, the closeness of medication and food, which is something I think we, use, we, we could usefully remind ourselves, uh, and I think what every nutritionist would, would, would point out and, and argue, is that it also gives you a perspective on the extent to which uh, condiments and uh, utensils were embraced within, within the home, and embraced within the, within the household. Because these volumes contain uh, passing references to things as, as, as uh, rare, you might suggest, or at least upmarket as sauce boats, sieves, the use of muslin in cooking, skillets, strainers, tablespoons, rolling pins, forks, punch bowls, frying, uh, frying pans, bread baskets, and, and, and so on. A, a list of them, but it's probably unintelligible. So I'll just put a picture of one, which is a, a brass dredger, which is really a fancy way of basically, you know, when you're sh shaking your uh, refined sugar on your, on your, on your, uh, your, 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 some of your, your bread or whatever this, this can be. The, the option of all of this in any event, just to get away from the detail, just to get off the line of interpretation, is really twofold. One is that it demonstrates, in terms of the, how the boundaries of food consumption in Ireland uh, that were being generated in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, were both English and European. Now, Ireland is becoming very much part of an English and European cultural, cultural realm in the quality of food. Most of, a lot of the recipes were taken from English sources, but a lot of the highest quality food, haute cuisine, which is French, of course, 17th century French invention, was entered into uh, Ireland by that means and uh, it was embraced within this, within the, within the diet. Now, moving on then to something basically which uh, Irish people are more obviously identified, that is than what cuisine, a bit unfairly I would suggest in both instances, one in the negative, one in the positive. And what, what I'm going to offer you here is an attempt to try and graphically illustrate the alcohol consumption in, in Ireland. The picture of, and, and how we understand alcohol effectively seems to be is, uh, well, I was going to say fatally, because that is a bit too extreme, but is, is irreducibly or irrevocably linked to temperance. And the perception is that if we, not least because we don't feel well the following morning, but if you, know, if you drink too much one night, 
it's, you feel like, oh, I'm apologizing, and there's a, the, the physiological impact is a manifestation itself of, its, of, it, of the fact that the, 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 the euphoria of the previous night is equated by the down of the following morning. And if you're, if you're a parent and you've got a 17 or 18 year old who basically is complaining and looking for relief and saying, well, there's no relief, you just put up with it in order to find you know, courage to be a caution, because that's what I did um, in any event. But basically, my point I would make about alcohol as, as a substance is that we shouldn't perceive it through the lens of the temperance advocates. We should see it through what it is. It basically is a commodity which has pros and cons in terms of how we engage and, 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 and use it. And the, the first period in Irish history which we can actually offer any sort of perspective is the 18th century. We've got statistics. And what these statistics allow us to do is to track alcohol consumption. So basically what, it, what the figures here demonstrate is that the course of the 18th century, alcohol consumption grew rapidly. Indeed, may even have grown, grown somewhere between four and tenfold, depending on the quantity. And you've got to acknowledge, first of all, the population rose during this period as well, so that's an important uh, consideration in, 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 that, in that respect. But there are other important considerations, is why were people drawn to alcohol? And one of the crucial factors was, in particular if you're living in an urban area, it brings up Irish water, so this is a dimension of war as a part of this is. You, could, you couldn't be sure of the quality of the water. So basically, at least the one thing you could assume with drinking alcohol, and particularly low alcohol um, qualities. Small beer was the most notable one, which is 2 to 3%. You know, in the past, they could have non alcoholic almost in the present environment. You basically were drinking, you knew that the, water, the, the liquid you were consuming was, was uh, secure. That it wasn't actually uh, going to, going to uh, it wasn't harboring uh, uh, germs and bacteria. Not that they were known about at the time in, in any event, but was a, that connection was, was made. So one of the reasons, one of the implications of this was that you can see households buying in bulk. And when I say in bulk, they're, they're buying by commodity in volumes you wouldn't actually imagine. The favorite, one of the favorite volumes was the, uh, uh, was, was a thing called a hogshead, which was 63 gallons. And a household might buy just 63 gallons every six months or every, every couple of years. Uh, and this ensures them basically of, the, of, of a quantity, but it also meant that alcohol was consumed daily. And in certain contexts, it basically was consumed breakfast, dinner, and tea, which may mean, you might suggest, well, people must have been operating through a certain degree of alcoholic haze and all their daily activities, which I don't, can't deny, because basically I think it, it, it was a, a, a factor in all of this. But in any event, what is striking about alcohol during this period is that in reality, of the main alcohol commodities that are consumed, beer was the least significant. This is beer consumption. And basically, you know, to aggregate the average average, it is much less than um, spirits and wine. And this is the other important point about it, about to make about this, is that uh, I suppose the standard alcohol that people consumed in the 18th and early 19th centuries uh, amongst the population at large it was, uh, was whiskey, the spirits in one shape form. About two thirds of what was consumed was whiskey, about one quarter of what was consumed was rum, and the rest then was gin, and well, gin was very, 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 very small in actual fact. Brandy was the other of, of significant uh, commodity. Uh, gin, whiskey, thank you very much. Gin, or rather, whiskey wasn't consumed uh, <clears throat> straight. It was mainly drank as a, as a bunch of cordials earlier. It was mainly drank in the form of punch. And there were things put in punch. I was looking at a recipe just before it came out, just to re rehearse it in my mind again, from the county of Fermanagh, which involved using mint and butter. And I, I honestly, for the life of me, I just can't imagine how it could be actually tasty. But then again, it must be in an environment where human tastes are very, very so, very so profoundly. The other crucial factor about this period is that alcohol, or alcohol production shifts dramatically because the state gets involved. And a you know, previous speaker made reference to the fact that the amount of money, uh, a proportion of, of the, uh, every euro you spend on petrol actually goes to the taxman. Well, in the 18th century, the recognition, the perception that um, the state needed to regulate alcohol production, specifically whiskey production as a revenue revenue raising measure, but was cru crucial. So the, the upshot of which was that you got two types of whiskey in the popular mind. What was known as Parliament whiskey, which was basically one which you paid the tax, which was done legitimately, which was done to the revenue commissioners, and they, they were an extraordinary organization even in the 18th century. And secondly, what you actually had was that you had illicit distillation. And we think 
at this period of being, of being a period in which there's a lot of illicit distillation. In practice, it was more regional, and actually the region shift is pushed further and further west and further and further north. In the early 19th century, it's all about the exit. This, this is the reason why not only does whiskey production rise, but it's legal whiskey production that, that, that rises. In terms of wines, I mean, the perception of some of us is that having started off drinking wine and drinking Californian carafe. I don't know if you remember carafe, you're probably too young to know Californian carafe, but it was vile uh, in retrospect. Or, or the worst of, it, of Italian, uh, Penrotti. Or, or, or they are equally the worst of, of uh, poor uh, French wines that were, uh, that you know, we, we get for we, we, we get cheap in the, in the local supermarket. In the 18th century, wine was consumed in very large volumes. Basically, between one and one and a half million uh, gallons of uh, wine was imported annually. And you, you could in Dublin in the, in the, towards the later part of the century, you could, you could get the, the finest wines that were be produced in Europe. There were shops that had the Shadow Margaux, all your Grand Cru wines uh, were, were, were there. French wine, interestingly, was more popular in Ireland than, it, uh, than any other, uh, until basically the Napoleonic Wars it, 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 it didn't do for it very well, and it, it, it was plummeted. Uh, the second was Portuguese uh, wines. Uh, in, in the longer term, though, it was the poor relation of all these, which is uh, beer, which basically rises as the combination of the, the loss of interest in France, the decline of the, uh, the, of the elite, the wine was drunk right across the board, and, uh, and the and temperance, which emphasizes the desirability of consuming beer, leads to the situation whereby in the 19th century, beer becomes the choice. Thing of choice. And of course, there's one other factor. And this is, ties in with this uh, 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 trade show. This is Guinness's. Guinness has emerged as one of the great firms, one of the great food producers, in this drink producers. People who said that eating and drinking, nothing to say about them, point to Guinness. Uh, basically, they were, they had nutrition. The calorific content of alcohol is something I have, I'm fascinated by, but don't actually have any information. Finally, then, because I'm sure our timekeeper will be giving me my final marching orders very quickly, the last point I would like to draw reference to you is the, the whole issue of, of, of fine dining. Fine dining in Ireland was something that uh, we, we, we don't associate with them very, very rarely, and, and very, very rarefied. You know, we associate with the French port in the 17th century, it spreads from there right across Europe. In, when you get to the uh, end of the 19th century, as dining, public dining emerges as a phenomenon, you basically also get some really fine restaurants in, in Ireland. And the striking thing about them is that one is the extent to which it's hotel based, and the second is the extent to which it's influenced by waiters and particularly chefs who come to Ireland from the continent. So, uh, Zen and Geldof, and you can, you can you know, there aren't many Geldofs in Ireland to make any sort of, to, to, to miss a connection. So, this, this is the ancestor of the of Geldofs of more recent. Uh, but this is the best of Jamais restaurant basically emerges in and lasts from 1901 to 1967, and it is a particularly notable restaurant, not only in, uh, on the Irish stage, but basically in European terms. And believe it or not, Ireland's was Ireland had sustained epicure tourism in the early first half of the, uh, the, the 20th century, most notably during the Second World War, because they had two things going in its favour. One is the quality of its projects, no rationing or at least the hotels of the Shelburne and St. James and so on in And the second was cheap labour. And as any of you in the food and drinks industry will know, it's, it's quality of produce and, and, and labour costs that are at the heart of, 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 of its costs. And these, these re restaurants were actually you know, got Michelin stars, Michelin chorists, long before they were even notable, or long before they basically would be emblazoned on the, on the uh, outside. The point I have to sum up is that while we all think of Patrick Gibo, perhaps even Chapter 1 today, and some restaurants and other locations, as a particularly manif modern manifestation, there was a period in the, in the, third, in the, 50, sorry, in the 60s, 70s and 80s where things were not good, but the last quarter of a century has been good, and prior to that it was a quarter of a half century in which things were spectacularly good. So overall, the point I would make about all of this is that by just focusing on these three themes and topics is that the history of Irish food is relevant and it's more than just anecdotal. It can help us, it can guide in terms of uh, shaping uh, ideas less, not so much about what well, our previous speaker was talking about in terms of 
get your invoices paid, but in terms of providing the inspiration, providing people with the confidence and the self-belief. And finally, to also illustrate that basically patterns of consumption in terms of food and drink are constantly changing. I mean, they have changed since the Mesolithic, when it actually it was hunter-gatherers with vegetal matter being dominant. You know, the, the Normans, when they came, basically expanded greatly the amount of uh, vegetal matter we, we consumed. But the English, when they became dominant in the early modern period, they gradually brought about great change as well. Even the humble little potato that I'd love to talk to you about, basically was, by contrast with the, with the bread and, and tea diet that dominated after the Great Famine, a much more nutritious way of, of living than it was on tea and, and, and bread. The problem, of course, was that tea was less susceptible to something like potato blight, and certainly uh, bread wasn't susceptible to it at all. You've been very kind, thank you very much.